Okay, so this is that period of time where the computer is lying to me and telling me that it's still setting up the feed. But I think now we're officially on. I want to see it on the screen because I don't trust Facebook or my own technical skills because I've been known to post it to my personal page accidentally. Am I on? Nobody knows. Okay, there we go. It looks like I am. Hello, and welcome to Tea and Notebook Tuesday. I'm Lisa. I'll be your librarian. I'm coming to you live from Ben May Main Library. Today we're going to talk about the last of the April titles. Uh, so we're going to do the genre science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Uh, I'm not going to do any nonfiction today because I had so much fiction to talk about, but I'm going to go ahead and put a list up on our Goodreads group that will include a whole bunch of nonfiction and some fiction, all of which received critical acclaim when it was released, or before it was released, I should say. Um, so everything they got star reviews from the different publications that librarians read. I always try to fit them in. Somehow they just never get put in, especially when they don't have a really clear genre. Um, but a lot of really good books don't have clear genres and I don't want you guys to miss out on them. So I'll put a list of them on the Goodreads uh, groups so that you can go and peruse at your leisure. All right, let's go ahead and share our screen. Maybe, possibly. Yeah, maybe you will want this one. Do I want this one? Kind of, sort of, ish. There we go. Tea and New Book Tuesday for March 23rd, 2020, 21. Yeah, it's 2021. That is a, a true statement. It's disturbing as it is. Today, I am drinking my Tazo vanilla bean macaron because that's what I had on hand. I had some honey and chamomile this morning, which was very nice. I think that was twinning, so. But now I need my, my caffeine to get going. As I said, we're going to talk about science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And this Friday, if you are wanting to go out and have some fun, we are going to do another outdoor movie in the parking lot here at Maine. It will be Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and it starts at 6.30. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, today's giveaway. Okay. Today's giveaway is a surprise. I will let you know as soon as we get to that book or books uh, what it's about and how to win. So stay tuned. All right. As always, at the end of the month, I'm going to give you a quick audiobook update. Um, just a lay of the land in terms of what audiobooks I've discussed over the course of the last month that are that we are also buying on audio. Uh, it includes, as I explained before, Jenny Lawson's Broken in the Best Possible Way and Bob Drury and Tom Calvin's Blood and Treasure, Daniel Boone and the Fight for the American Frontier. Those are the two nonfiction titles. In fiction, we have mostly thrillers, uh, Animal Instinct by David Rosenfeld, Mother May I by Jocelyn Jackson, the beloved Jocelyn Jackson, Ann Hillerman's Stargazer, John Sanford's Ocean Prey, and Jeffrey Archer's Turn a Blind Eye. Also, When the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean, The Good Sister by Sally Hepworth, 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 Hepworth? I don't know. Uh, David Baldacci's A Gambling Man, and Karen Kingsbury's A Distant Shore. There is actually one more audiobook, but I won't tell you which one it is until we get to that book. Now, let's start talking about our fiction. Because as I said, nonfiction will be on Goodreads. Uh, starting with Folklore by Angela Me Young Her. This is about Elsa Park, who's a particle physicist in the Arctic. She's been putting her ambitions first and as a way to put distance between herself and the ghosts of her past. Uh, years ago, her Korean immigrant mother told her that there was a family curse that doomed them to live the lives of their ancestors. She's more worried about sort of tangible family problems like uh, mental illness and trauma, things like that. 
But tragedy strikes and Elsa is forced to return to her home in California. And she finds some stories that her mother wrote that are dark and filled with family secrets. This is described as fairly genre bending, um, but also elements of fantasy and mag magical realism. It's got a handful of good, reading, good ratings on Goodreads and they put it at nearly four stars. If you're interested in folklore, it comes out April 7th. All right, Lord of Order by Brett Riley. I actually got to read the beginning of this and hear the author speak, um, which was enough to convince me I think you guys might be interested in this book. It's set in a future where all electronic technology has been destroyed. The US is ruled by a fundamental Christian theocracy. The group in charge is called the Bright Crusade. Our protagonist is Gabriel Troy, who is the Lord of Order in the New Orleans Principality. Uh, he gets orders from Washington that arrive with a Supreme Commander whose name is Matthew Rook. Rook is planning on rounding up anyone but the blindly loyal to the Bright Crusade, putting them all in New Orleans, walling off the city, and then breaking the levees. So essentially they're going to put all of their enemies into New Orleans and then flood New Orleans. Um, this puts Gabriel Tro Troy in a very difficult situation between his loyalty to the Bright Crusade who will kill him if he is disloyal and his loyalty to the city that he spent his life protecting. Um, there are not really enough early reviews for me to mention on this one. However, it's worth checking out, if only because it's obviously a Hurricane Katrina allegory. And that's very interesting to those of us here. If you're interested in Lord of Order, it comes out on April 6th. All right. The Drowning Kind by Jennifer McMahon. 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 Um, so this is about social worker Jax who sees one day that she's got nine missed calls from her older sister, Lexi. It's not a complete surprise. Uh, Lexi has manic episodes. She's often out of touch with reality and she's been pushing Jax away quite a lot lately. But the next day, Lexi is found dead. Uh, Jax returns home and finds that Lexi was searching through the family's past and their property. Uh, it turns out that the family may have a much darker backstory than either of them knew. This got a star review on Kirkus. Uh, it has over four stars from early reviewers on Goodreads. It is the title from this week that is going to be also be bought on audio. If you're interested in The Drowning Kind, it comes out April 6th. All right, first become Ashes. By K.M. Size Paris is part. This is poor. No idea. Uh, author of the book Docile. Okay, first become Ashes about Lark. Lark has trained, I think it's a him, yeah, his whole life for a quest. He's gone through intense physical pain and endurance to build himself up. <clears throat> He's going to rid the world of monsters. He's going to use his innate magic, which he has spent a long time developing to do it. Then his leader is arrested by the FBI and charged with assault and abuse. And the government officials are trying to convince Lark that everything he has been told is wrong. There are no, there are no monsters. There is no magic in the world. Um, and everything he has endured is for nothing. So this is described as a standalone adventure that will leave readers wondering what is magical and what is real. It has LGBTQ plus themes and is written by a queer trans author. If you are interested in First Become Ashes, it comes out on April 6th. All right, Malice. No, Malice is not on this page. Malice is on this page. All right, Once Upon a Time, a wicked fairy spurned by the royals cursed a young princess to die with the curse only being broken if she receives a true lover's kiss. All of this is nonsense because the people of Briar don't really care about their princesses. They should. Their cursed princess Aurora is the final in her line and is probably the kind of queen that they really need. 
our main character is actually a dark fairy, fairy who uses the same kind of magic that cursed Aurora. Um, she is not the fairy that cursed Aurora, but she is treated as less than by all the nobles who also want her to brew po potions for them at the same time. Um, as the fairy and Aurora become closer, the fairy starts to wonder that if she works the same kind of magic that created the curse, maybe her kind of magic could help break the curse. Uh, this is, as you can tell, a darkly magical retelling of Sleeping Beauty with LGBT LGBTQ plus representation in the mix. It already has over four stars on Goodreads from a couple hundred early readers. Uh, if you're interested in Malice, it comes out April 13th. All right, Composite Creatures by Caroline Hardacker. Um, Hardacker. I don't know what to do with this one because the description, I couldn't work with it to create a description for you guys. All I've got is this. It's a dystopian tale about how to stay alive at the end of the world. At the beginning, we meet Noah um, and she's meeting Art, which it seems like a first date, but then it turns out to be something else. Uh, the book is also described as having a slow burn, so it's not a twisty, turny kind of thing. Most of what I just noted came from one of the reader reviews, not from the description, because I, I can't work with that description. But one of the reasons I wanted to mention, despite not being able to describe it very well, is that it got a starred review on Booklist, um, and Publishers Weekly described it as thought provoking, as thought provoking as it is creepy. All of which is a pretty hearty recommendation. So if you're interested in composite creatures, it comes out April 13th. Uh, if you don't know what to do with it, you might go read the descriptions online. And that first review that Goodreads has pinned is pretty thorough. Uh, at any rate, comes out April 13th. Okay, Puppy Show. Puppy Show by Leon Ross. Um, it's a novel where magic is everywhere and there are a wide cast of characters to deal with. So we've got Xavier, who has a... Who, whose gift is anointed by the gods. The gift in question is that he can create a perfect meal for any person when their time is right. Uh, we also have Anise, who is a healer trying to reckon with her powers. We have a governor who's demanding privileges out of turn and graffiti from an unknown person that is trying to ask hard questions. Meanwhile, a storm is brewing that's going to bring all of these people together. There are a handful of uh, reviews up on Goodreads and they give it a rating of over four stars. It got starred on both Booklist and Kirkus. I don't know, have I ever explained a starred review? Basically, these publications are filled with nothing but reviews. There's occasionally a couple articles in the beginning and then it's all reviews. And in each section, they'll star a couple of re reviews, essentially saying this is their favorite books um from this issue so it got that from two different publications if you're interested in papi show it comes out april 20th all right one of the reasons we've gone through the first several so fast is because this one's going to take a while all right whisper down the lane by clay mcleod chapman it is today's giveaway this is the first of two actually uh if you would like to <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you'd like to enter to win Whisper Down Lane, put your, uh, I want to win and your MPO location for pickup in the comments. Uh, as I said, there's another one, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So Whisper Down the Lane is loosely inspired by the McMartin preschool trials and the satanic panic in the 80s. Having said that, I now have to explain that whole case. Um, I found out about this, and bear in mind, I read a fair amount of horror, so I've come across various stories that are supposed to be real life exorcisms or things like that. I'm not super into the true stuff because I'd rather it was fantasy for my own reasons, um, but 
I don't remember the name of the podcast, but it's uh, Dax Shepard's podcast. He interviewed a professor who's an expert on exorcism in an episode like a year ago, maybe two years at the most. And that professor mentioned this trial, which is why as soon as they said that that's what this book was taking as inspiration, I was automatically interested because it's a fascinating and in many ways disturbing series of events. So here's what happened. Um, it was a series of trials in which po prosecutors alleged that the McMartin family had sexually abused children at their daycare and had done so as part of satanic rituals. This came in a time when because of heavy metal music and because of other things that were happening at the time, there was a lot of media speculation and speculation from politicians and other pretty authoritative sources that people were turning to Satanism and were per performing satanic rituals. What I find so fascinating about this case is that I had not heard anything about it. And I don't even, I kind of vaguely remember the discussion about the satanic panic when I was a kid, but I think I was just too young to really have interpreted it as anything to take seriously. Um, when you're a kid, adults are worried about a lot of things that you're just like, I don't, okay, I don't see that as a thing. Uh, either because you're just not there yet or because you don't see it in your life and therefore it doesn't make any sense. Um, the satanic panic, that's, that was kind of my response. I think I remember it being on TV vaguely. I don't know. But anyway, uh, the, initial accus the initial accusation came from a mother who, as it turns out, um, was a paranoid schizophrenic and an alcoholic. But she made the accusation and the investigators then sent a form letter to 200, the families of 200 children who were in that daycare. Um, the form letter alleged that their children may have been abused and that they needed to question their children on the topic. That is a list of things I think that doesn't happen anymore because as we've come to understand how to work with children who've experienced trauma, that's not how you approach it. <laughs> I think we may have learned some of those things from this case though. The evidence that was gathered after that has been described generously as bizarre. Um, the, oh God, what was it? They claimed they were taken into tunnels underneath the school. They claimed that one of the teachers could fly. There was discussion about witches. At one point, one of the kids identified a picture of Chuck Norris and said he was one of the abusers. They investigated all of this. There were no tunnels underneath the school. They destroyed the school and dismantled the whole thing, dug underneath it, no tunnels. Uh, Chuck Norris was nowhere near there. Oh, there's no reason to believe the teachers could fly or that witches had been on the premises or that any of these things had happened. When you get into the trial, there's also allegations against the prosecution that they withheld exonerating evidence. And some of those accusations against the, the prosecution come from former members of the prosecution who quit over it. Like it's that bad. Um, the trials, because there were multiples of them, they cost $15 million and it took seven years. There were no convictions. The evidence is not great at best that this actually happened. And the exonerating evidence, again, was withheld. So when it was presented, then that's sort of when the whole thing wrapped up. One of the children has also recanted his accusation as an adult. He has flat out said that he lied because when they were being interviewed, if he told them nothing happened, they would continue to question him about the exact same event, basically until he said something had happened. So he gave them the answer they wanted is what it came down to. The weird thing about this case to me is that it's all but forgotten. This was years, this was massive newspaper stories on TV, all the things. 
And Margaret Talbot for the New York Times writes, when you once believe something that now strikes you as absurd, even unhinged, it can be almost impossible to summon that feeling of credulity again. Maybe that is why it's easier for us to forget rather than to try and explain the satanic abuse scare that gripped this country in the early 80s. The myth the devil worshipers had set up shop in our daycares. I feel like these are the sort of things we should talk about more um, because obviously it profoundly affected the lives of these people. It cost the taxpayers in California literally millions of dollars. And it puts into perspective how much a community can come to believe something with little to no evidence, even when it negatively affects people's lives. So coming back around to this book, that's the original case, that's the, the true case. In the book, one of our main characters, Richard, has no past, only his present. He has a new marriage, he has a chance of fatherhood, and he has a job teaching art at a Virginia elementary school. Then the body of a rabbit, ritualistically murdered, shows up at school grounds, and it has a birthday card for Richard underneath it. Meanwhile, Sean, a five-year-old in a single-parent household, um, whose, mo whose mother is mostly worried about practical things, like putting food on the table, but is also worried about the growing Satanism she's told exists in America. Then a letter arrives from the school telling Sean's mother that someone at the school may be abusing children and Satanism may be involved. And Sean decides to tell a little white lie. 30 years later, someone still remembers the case and is going to see and is going to make sure that Richard also remembers it. Um, this was recommended by several publications. It got a starred review from Publishers Weekly. I was seriously close to just keeping it and reading it myself. <laughs> um, so if you're the one who wins this, or if you put it on hold and read it, come back to the comments or email me at lbarnes at mplonline.org and let me know what you thought of it, because I think this could be a really interesting book. At any rate, it comes out April 6th. Although some lucky winner could have it in their hands by Saturday, maybe early Monday, we'll see. All right, and our very last book to discuss is also our second giveaway, Mirrorland by Carol Johnstone. Okay, so if you wanna win either of these, put I want to win and your MPL location for pickup in the comments below. In Mirrorland, Kat lives in LA but she grew up in a Gothic mansion in Scotland with her twin sister. She and her twin sister are now estranged and Kat does her best not to think about her childhood or the house in Scotland um, or the fact that her twin sister is still living in that house. Then her sister goes missing during a boating trip and Kat is forced to return home. She finds clues left for her in every room of the mansion she thinks they may have been left by her twin sister and that they all lead her to their childhood escape, which was a made up land of pirates and witches called Mirrorland. This has been re recommended by Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Stephen King and Ruth Ware. It's described as having the twists and turns of Gone Girl and the emotional power of Room. If you're interested in putting Mirrorland on hold, it comes out April 20th. If you wanna win it, then put I want to win in your MPL location for pickup in the comments below. All right. I will get that list onto Goodreads as soon as I can, hopefully by this afternoon. Uh, if you haven't joined us on Goodreads, as I said, I put extra titles up there in addition to putting every title that I discuss on the show. Uh, if you want to win, you know how to win by now. We've discussed it several times. And if you want to join our newsletter, it gives you a chance to click from the description of the book right to our catalog to put things on hold. It's called MPL Pre-Orders. Join me next week for the beginning of May. We're going to do the biggest book releases in May. And I'll see you then. 
Have a good week, guys. Bye.